Last month, we talked about uh, handling events inside of GL Studio RSO in a third-party application. This month, we're going to go ahead and take a step back, and we're actually going to talk about embedding a GL Studio RSO into a third-party window. In this case, what I've done, <clears throat> if you can see my screen, is I've taken our uh, GL Studio GLUT integration example from our support site, and I've factored it down quite a bit. Now it's uh, contained with, entirely within a separate single source file. And what we're going to do over the next 20 minutes is actually place a GL Studio component into this window. We're going to talk about the different function calls we have to make and uh, why they're important and what they're used for, as well as the different dependencies that we're going to need in order to have GL Studio run effectively inside a third-party window, such as this. So we're going to begin <coughs> inside our main CPP. We have our single include right now, GLUT. And right now, all we have in here is our GLUT initialization. If we look through this, we have our function prototypes. Now, since this is a, a single app or a single source file application, I'm going to go ahead and use globals for things such as our window width, our window height, and our uh, GLCU component. Uh, obviously, inside a much larger application, you're going to want to have this all located inside its own class. So we have our globals for our width and height. We have function prototypes. <clears throat> we'll be talking about these more when we get down to the main function. Uh, we also have a few more methods for specifically for our GLUT callbacks. We'll be talking a little bit about those as we get there. And for this particular webinar, we're going to be talking specifically about actually bringing in the uh, visual aspects of the GLCO component. Next month, we're going to be expanding on this exact same demo, and we'll be talking more about handling mouse and keyboard events within our RSO. So moving down, we have our main function. <clears throat> for now, we're going to set our window width and height to be 500. We'll be changing that as we actually bring in the RSO. And as you can see here, all I've done is taken all the steps that we need to do and broken them down into five methods. The first one is the initialization of GLUT. As you can see, I pass in our argc and argv, which are brought in for us from main. The second step is actually to load the GL Studio RSO. And for this, I use a couple of pound defines. We have our GLS file name and our GLS class name, which these are uh, defined above to help us out just for uh, making quick changes to this uh, particular application. Notice that load RSO returns a Boolean. We'll be getting to exactly why later. This will correspond to whether or not we were successfully able to load our DLL. If we were not, then we'll just go ahead and return one. This will prevent us from having to do an error check to see if uh, the component is valid later on. Step three, we actually take our GLUT window and we actually create it. Step four is we take all of our different GLUT callbacks. We'll go ahead and register them at this point. And then at step five, we'll actually go ahead and run the application. So let's go ahead and look at all these, or all of what we have currently. Uh, at this point, no GL Studio code has been added. This is just GLUT. Inside step one, our init GLUT method. All we do here is call, of our, call our GLUT initialization routines. The first one, <coughs> our standard GLUT init, which just initializes, initializes the, GL, the uh, OpenGL utility toolkit. We initialize the window position. In this case, we're going to start it at 0, 0, which in screen space corresponds to the upper left-hand corner. And then we're going to go ahead and set our uh, initial display mode. In this case, we have RGBA. We're using double buffering, and we have the death buffer enabled. Step two, load RSO. At this point, we're not doing anything with GL Studio, so we're just going to go ahead and return true. Step three, creating the GLUT window. We set up our viewport. <coughs> to be, uh, in this case, is just going to be the width and the height of the window. We initialize the, window, the uh, GLUT window itself to be that same width and height. Then we actually call create window, give it the name or the title of our window. In this case, I'm just calling it my GLUT window. And then we'll go ahead and set the OpenGL clear color. In this case, we're going to go just a uh, medium blue. Next step is to register our callbacks. We're going to be talking more about the callbacks later on in our tutorial. Uh, but for now, we know we have three different callbacks defined. We have a callback for if the window gets resized. We have a callback for actually rendering our display. And then a callback for whenever we're idle, which will be, in this case, where we're going to be calling our calculate, everything we're doing in our main loop. Finally, run app simply calls glut main loop. And this actually starts the application working. So at this point, <clears throat> without taking a look at our callbacks, we'll be coming to them later. If I go ahead and build this, the output is simply going to be a single window with our clear color blue rendered at 500 pixels by 500 pixels. Kind of boring. 
what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and start including our GL Studio related stuff in here. The first we're going to need is <clears throat> a global. We're going to have a, a DISC component base. Make it a component base pointer. We'll call it G underscore P component. It's a global variable, which is a pointer to our component. At this point, we're going to need to go ahead and include some files. <clears throat> we'll go ahead and pound include. And by the way, it's very important that we actually include this above glut.h, and I will talk about why here at the end. Uh, pretty much has to do with multiply defined symbols uh, involving including glut before anything else. In this case, we'll go ahead and include component base.h. At this point, the component base exists inside the distinct namespace. <clears throat> However, to go ahead and save time, we're going to go ahead and just uh, use the entire DC namespace here. This will uh, allow us to not have to worry about actually declaring what actually exists, of course, in the DC namespace. It'll just make things go a little bit quicker. So we've got our, glo our global variable, p, uh, g underscore p component. Let's go ahead and initialize it down here at the rest of our global variables. And we'll just go ahead and take this component and set it equal to null for now. <clears throat> also here, we're going to be creating a new um, RSO, or we're going to be creating a new component base object inside load RSO. So at the very end of our application, we're going to go ahead and free up the memory used by the program. And we're going to do this by calling g underscore p component and just calling its destroy method. This will go ahead and uh, free up our memory for us. Uh, we do this instead of calling delete. And that's also very important to note. We're not actually going to call the delete on our new component. We actually call it the destroy method, which will go ahead and clean up our memory for us. Optionally, if we were going to be reusing this component later on in the application, uh, we know we're not in this case. But if we were, we would just go ahead and reset this to null. So now, <clears throat> let's go through our methods. Init glut. We don't need to make any changes in here, but loading the RSO, this is where a lot of our work happens. So our first step to actually put, bring in an RSO into our application is to actually create a new uh, component base object. How do we do this? <clears throat> there is a static method inside of component base called create live component. Create Life Component takes in several members. We notice that the default initial or the default initializer creates an empty component base. Uh, we know in this case that we actually have a DLL name, which satisfies our first uh, or our first parameter here, the file name, and we also have a class name. Notice that the class name can also be null. If the class name is null in this case, what it'll do is go ahead and take in the default class name, which would be the essentially the name of the DLL with the word class appended to the end. Um, some other different or some other information here. The third parameter, uh, perform create by default is true. Uh, what this will do if we leave it alone is it will call create objects for us on the component as soon as it's created automatically. If we set this to false, then it'll allow us a little more control and allow us to uh, call create by or or call create ourselves. The final parameter is the actual uh, version info that corresponds to um, the version of GL Studio that this RSO was built with. We see by default it calls a method called GLS built version info, and this will be fine for us. So we'll go ahead and uh, pass in our DLL name and our class name to this. We'll leave everything else alone so that we actually get um, create window called for us. <coughs> I'm sorry, create objects called for us. And in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to check our P component to determine whether or not we actually return true or false. If create like create live component succeeds, it actually creates the reference to the component. Everything works OK. If it fails, it will return null. So we'll go ahead and use this as our test. So if we actually have a valid component, we'll return true. Otherwise, return false. And that's all we're going to need to do here. So we've initialized glut. We've attempted to load our RSO. And if that succeeds, we continue on to step three, which is actually creating the glut window. We have a little bit of work to do in here as well. <clears throat> By default, we're starting our window width and window height at 500 and 500. 
if we wanted to actually create a window that matches the bounds of our component exactly, we'll have to add the following. <clears throat> First, we'll create a few uh, different variables to actually hold our information. And what we're going to be doing is we're actually going to be getting the extents of the RSO. And we're going to be using those extents to get the correct window width and, or the correct width and height of the component. And we'll initialize the actual uh, viewport and the default window size to be that width and height. In order to do this, we take the component and we'll call its method getExtents. GetExtents takes in six parameters. Those six parameters are the bottom left, x1, y1, z1, and the top right, x2, y2, z2. <clears throat> we pretty much get the extents of the component in 3D space. In this case, we're not so com concerned about the z value as we are the x and the y, because the actual width of the window could be thought of as being the maximum x minus the minimum x. Also, the window height is the max y minus min y. So now that we've done this, <clears throat> we've adjusted the window width and height, and the viewport and the initial window size will go ahead and just uh, match the suit automatically, since we're going ahead and using the global variables that we defined above. So we'll move on from here. Going back up to main, step four is defining and registering our callbacks. There's nothing we need to do as far as registering the callbacks. However, there will be some work we have to do in the callbacks. Um, run app, that still calls glut main loop. We don't need to make any changes there. So now let's actually take a look at our callbacks. As I said, the only callbacks that we're going to concern ourselves with today are going to be the callbacks that <clears throat> involve resizing our window which there really needs not be a change here. All this does is takes in the width and height of the window that we're, or the new uh, size of the window when the user actually drags the bottom corner or any of the corners and actually resizes. This will just reshape uh, the viewport and reshape the entire window based on those values that are passed in. The display callback. <clears throat> we see by default the display callback handles are real, real basic uh, GL, open GL rendering. We clear the back buffer, the, both the color and the death buffers. <clears throat> we just set up a, a default projection. In this case, we're using an orthographic <clears throat> projection. We're using um, the width of the window, the height of the window, and then we're going from negative 500 to 500 on the depth. We switch back to the model view matrix, and we just load an identity matrix into the model view. At this point, we we're ready to actually add some GLC or drawing code. Once we've drawn our GL Studio stuff, <clears throat> we'll go ahead and just pop the mat or pop the uh, different matrices that we created up above. So we're going to reset everything back to the way it was before we even came into this function. Then we go ahead and uh, show the back buffer, and we post the redisplay message to Glut. Finally, the main loop callback, it's currently empty. We're going to be adding in our calculate code here. And if we have any uh, other parameters that we want to set here, this is where we'll do it. So, <clears throat> reshape callback, nothing needs to be done here. Display callback, this is where a lot of the work is going to be happening today. So let's start with what we're actually going to do to actually get our GLCO component to draw properly. The first thing we want to do is create a Boolean. We're going to call it save val, and we're going to set it equal to true. Now, GL Studio has its own uh, different states for the OpenGL engine that it needs in order to correctly draw its objects. If these might differ from any other drawing code that's going on in the application, that could cause some issues. So the first thing we're going to do is we're actually going to save our default states. <clears throat> we're going to call a method inside display frame called set OpenGL default state. And as the comment reads, it'll set up the OpenGL pipeline to the state expected by GL Studio drawing. We'll pass in our one parameter, which is our save val pretty much saying we want to actually save the current state before we create the new states to match GL Studio. This way, when we actually get done with our GL Studio drawing, we can revert the open GL states to what they were before we actually uh, set them ourselves. So we'll do that. <clears throat> now, GL Studio has primarily three functions that are used for most of its uh, drawing and updating. The first one's calculate. The other two are pre-draw and draw. So let's actually take a look at these functions now. 
the easy one is draw. Draw will simply go through, take all the objects that are currently inside the scene, and render them to the active display. Draw takes in no parameters, so we really don't need to worry about it too much. The other method that we need to worry about is pre-draw. <clears throat> what pre-draw will do is actually take in the model view projection matrix matrices and a color to actually determine view frustum calling for us. We're going to need to create a few parameters in order for this to actually work. So <clears throat> before we can call pre-draw, we're going to need to get the OpenGL matrices, the projection matrix and the model view matrix. In order to do this, we're going to create an object of type OpenGL matrices. This also exists inside the DISTI namespace. And we'll just call it current matrices. Now that we have this object, <clears throat> we can call current matrices a method called getCurrent. And it would help if I spelled that right. We call getCurrent. What getCurrent does is it will check the current model view project the model current model view and the projection matrices currently stored in OpenGL and actually store them inside this current matrices variable. Now that model view and the projection matrix in this case were defined up here when we actually set up our stuff. So we've got our current matrices. Now that we have that, we can go ahead and create a color. And like I said, we use the DC namespace above, so we didn't actually have to declare these. The color <clears throat> it also exists in the DC namespace. And it's, the object, it's an object that's called color. In this case, we're going to go ahead and create our color. And by default, we'll pass in the value of false. We're going to be setting this ourselves. Color has one method that we're going to need to use. It's called extract frustum, which in this case will take in <clears throat> the uh, current model view and projection matrices that we had in the first step and actually use those as, or to determine its bounding box, to determine what objects will get called and what objects will get drawn at runtime. So go ahead and pass in our current matrices here. So now we have everything we need to successfully pre-draw. Remember, we had two parameters. The first one was our OpenGL matrices. And the second one was our color. <clears throat> we go ahead and draw. And then the very last step we have is to actually revert our OpenGL default states. We'll say if we actually saved the, the uh, previous states, we're going to want to go ahead and call the method display frame uh, restore OpenGL state. And this takes in no parameters. So there's our drawing code right there. <clears throat> this is really all we need to create a GeoCityRSO RSO and actually draw it inside a window. The last step, of course, is we're going to want to go and update our stuff based on whatever parameters we actually have set. We're going to do that using the calculate method, just like we would with the GeoCity application. So in this case, we'll call G components calculate. Calculate takes in a time value, which we don't yet have defined. So how are we going to get around this? Well, we can use a timer. GL Studio has a, a header file called timer.h, and it also has an associated variable type, a class type of timer, which we don't yet see here because timer.h hasn't made it into our uh, list of includes as far as the IntelliSense goes. We'll go ahead and just call this timer timer, and we'll actually be able to see this working below. Notice I actually do <coughs> include the scope here because there are different timer classes available with different APIs. So we just want to be careful that we're using the correct one. When we create a timer, its class constructor starts the timer going, and we'll literally track the execution time from when the actual application was started. So this is what Calculate's looking for. It's looking for the time in seconds that the application has been running. So we'll call timer, and it has a method called elapsed seconds double, which will pass in the double that Calculate needs. So at this point, we've actually done all the work we actually need to do to get a GL Studio component to render inside a GLUT window. The last thing we're going to look at quickly are our dependencies. We have our header files here. We have componentbase.h. We have our glut header file. We also have another timer.h, which is inside DISTI's include folder.
So what actually do we need here in order to get this thing running? Well, let's actually take a look at our project properties. We're going to go ahead and break them down. First thing, inside C, C++ General, our additional include directories. In this case, I just went ahead and moved a version of GLUT into my webinars folder <coughs> to make it easier for me to access. But you're going to want to include, using the GLCU environment variable, which points at your GLCU installation path, you're going to want to include the includes folder and the plugins include folder for GL Studio. Moving down just a little bit, <coughs> our preprocessor definitions are OK. However, if you're using Visual Studio 2005 or Visual Studio 2008, it's recommended to actually define underscore CRT secure no warnings. This will remove the uh, warnings involving deprecation for sprintf. Moving a little further down, we're actually done in here. We're going to go to the linker. Additional library directories. Just like with uh, the GLUT <coughs> and with uh, GL Studio, we're actually going to reference our bin folder for GLUT. And we're going to reference GL Studio's lib and plugins lib folders to get all the libraries that we need to actually uh, build our component. In this case, we're looking for references to component base and a timer. And that is what these two directories will satisfy. Finally, additional dependencies. <coughs> a couple things we're wanna, going to want to track. The ones that are actually relevant to GL Studio and to GLUT, we have our OpenGL32 lib and GLUT32 lib to satisfy GLUT. And then we have our GL Studio runtime libraries for the versions and um, <coughs> for not only the version of Visual Studio we're using, but also the build type. In this case, we want multi-threaded DLL for release and multi-threaded debug DLL for debug. So we'll go ahead and hit OK. And that's really all we're going to need to set as far as our properties. So hopefully, we did a lot of coding here without actually building the test to see if we did it right. We'll go ahead and build. And assuming that we did everything right, we'll have no compiler errors. And we'll go ahead and link without a problem. Now, for the sake of our demo, I've included inside our RSO and GLUT method, or RSO and GLUT folder, a RSO underscore altimeter DLL. Uh, this is the same altimeter that you see in the GL Studio tutorials. So we're going to go ahead and bring that in and attempt to run it inside our window. <coughs> now running in release, <coughs> by default when we actually run from Visual Studio, the current working directory is the directory where the VC proj file is located. And this actually is going to work out really good because that's where I stored my RSO. So if I go ahead and run here, it's going to attempt to load the altimeter with the class name altimeter class. If I run, we see the altimeter. Of course, it does look kind of boring. We're not really doing anything. And as I mentioned, we're going to be saving the mouse dragging, mouse moving, and mouse buttons for next month. So we see that as I try to adjust the knob and the switch, nothing happens. One thing we can do to actually make this <coughs> animate a little bit is actually adjust the resources. We can take our GL Studio properties and actually affect them in our GLUT window right now. Uh, to do this, we're going to use the set resource method. And for the altimeter, it has one property called testing which, when set to true, will actually ramp through testing values. So we'll go ahead and adjust this right now. Going all the way back down to the bottom of our file, back to the main loop callback, we'll go ahead and just set a resource value for testing. We take our component. We call it set resource method. And set resource takes in two strings. The first string is the property itself. The second string is a string representation of whatever that value would be. So in this case, we'll pass in testing and true. So we're saying the testing parameter to the value of true. Optionally, if we were going to set something such as a barometer or an, altim or an altimeter, we would have to take our double and actually uh, put that into a string version, which we could do that very easily just using uh, something like sprintf. So we'll go ahead and build this. And we'll run. <clears throat> and as we can see, we now have our GLUT window that correctly handles resize mes messages and animates the screen <clears throat> once per frame during our main, loop call or our main loop or idle callback. So this actually concludes our tech tip for today. <clears throat> uh, just to recap, we actually took a GLUT example. We created a very basic GLUT application. And then using the absolute minimum amount of GL Studio calls, 
we actually went ahead and created a GLUT RSO, or an RSO that actually renders inside a GLUT window. Once again, thank you for coming. Have a wonderful month. We'll see you back here in the month of October. Take care.